And good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, as you can see, I have a picture, but I hope you recognize this is not a picture of me. Everybody had their pictures. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be in trouble. Uh, but this is actually a, a sensitivity kernel picture. It's a 3D, uh, two slices. You see uh, uh, the bottom one is a uh, vertical slice, then there is a horizontal slice through it. And it's at the heart of FWI. Therefore, we're going to get back to it a little bit later. Uh, but first, uh, and of course, Anasatvi has to be in my title, otherwise nobody would hear me. Uh, I spent last fall at, uh, uh, at CWP, and it was really like uh, homecoming. It's like deja vu. And uh, uh, I really am thankful uh, for the faculty group and the students for having me, for being patient to my sometimes interesting habits. <laughs> but I also ended up uh, meeting these guys that uh, end up uh, uh, were visiting at the same time. And of course, this picture, Shingo took it, and I think the, the camera was a little bit tilted. Uh, therefore, it, <laughs> it showed, uh, showed me and Gerhard a little shorter. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I ended up, uh, of course, I was trying to help out in terms of uh, uh, Paul being in, on his uh, vacation, I'm on sabbatical, and, uh, and uh, trying to get the I-team a little bit uh, running. It's a big shoes to fill, literally. Uh, therefore, but I also had a chance to write my course note for an upcoming course. Uh, it's not a distinguished course, it's a, a normal course. Uh, and I learned more about it yesterday. But this is the title of the course, and it's focusing on full waveform inversion uh, in an anisotropic world. Where are the parameters hiding? I'm going to give a flavor of it today. Uh, but I learned yesterday that my course is cheap to enter. <laughs> I don't know if this is good or bad, but uh, compared to other, uh, one of my students told me about that, and I got in, uh, more information yesterday. But uh, at least uh, it's going to be first in Europe, London. I think uh, there's a couple of stops this summer, and uh, I hope it w goes fine. Uh, full waveform inversion. I mean, these guys brought it to the limelight, uh, brought it to the seismic uh, arena in a practical manner. And since they actually introduced it, 1983 and 1984, not much happened. And this is actually a figure that, uh, uh, that Antoine Gutin and myself showed in the uh, special section on full waveform inversion last September. And it shows the number of publications, uh, SCG abstracts and geophysics, therefore this is for the SCG, per year starting from 1984 when this was introduced. And not much attention was paid to FWI. Look at what happened recently. I showed a similar plot for anisotropy in a workshop, I think, like seven or eight years ago, and it was a linear increase. This was more like an exponential, or maybe, I don't know, I didn't put in a function to look at what type, but it's a huge uh, interest into the full waveform inversion. Why? One of the reasons is you get something like this for the Marmousi model. Look at it, with colors. Of course, compared to imaging. Sorry about the colors, Ken. <laughs> but you get details. Of course, this is not the most perfect. This is something we got recently. We'll show you how we got it, uh, I think, in the EAG me meeting and probably at the SCG. But this is the kind of information we could get from full waveform. Imagine a slice of this. Interpretation becomes simple. It contains it. This is why I, the way I think about full waveform inversion is like an artist, a sketch artist, or, or an artist in general. You could either take a sketch or a pencil uh, of your complexion, so you'll paint it, it's cheaper, or you could get a full color with the contrast well defined, and this is what FWI gives you, but at a much, more, a much uh, larger cost. Therefore, why FWI? We talked about it. Why now? Of course, the computers allow us to do so. Why not anisotropy? Of course, and anisotropy is going to get there. 
Uh, some people have attempted uh, and showed some interesting, even unreal data, but it's still a big and challenging subject. And we saw some of that yesterday, thanks to Nishant's uh, presentation, which really helps what I'm going to show uh, in, a, in a little bit. However, one of the reasons we're still not addressing this problem is we're not applying FWI a lot to real data. We're doing a lot of Marmor C yet. Uh, Here's a picture from that uh, same special section. This is courtesy of ExxonMobil, and this is a very beautiful result of, ang of uh, image gathers. And you can see this is after FWI. And notice, uh, I'm going to have to point here that it's well, well uh, aligned, which w w the thing we try to uh, end up uh, uh, getting. But nevertheless, there is some concaved upward shape to these gathers, and it's consistent laterally. You can see it almost everywhere, right about here, here, and this is what we usually define, especially when it's consistent laterally. They didn't apply any anisotropy here. It is caused by anisotropy, and this is real data. Therefore, anisotropy will come around, and we will have to address it at some point because the real Earth is anisotropy. Uh, you wouldn't expect otherwise from my mouth. <laughs> and you see it in these outcrops. You see it in every place. It's all related to the wavelength scale issue and the thin layering, which happens, of course, thanks to gravitational. And even what I say usually, even the permits is anisotropic with all. And that's natural. Actually, anisotropy is natural. What is unnatural is isotropy. You have to put up energy to make things isotropic. But usually anisot becomes, thanks to gravity, natural to many phenomena that we do, especially depending on physics. Therefore, the big question is how do we get these parameters? That's the complexity, of course. Why we're avoiding anisotropy, it's the complexity of estimating the parameter, which is still a big issue. And a lot of uh, rigorization, a lot of a priori is needed. How about FWI as a solution? However, to understand what anisotropy could look like as we implement FWI, we're going to have to first investigate what is at the heart of FWI, the update process, the gradient. And of course here, the gradient is well defined by the Born approximation. Uh, Nishant showed us some of that, and actually I'm going to end up showing radiation patterns, not of sources, uh, like what we saw most of the morning, but uh, of virtual sources, the scattering that we're trying to estimate. And therefore, there's a lot of relation in that aspect. And one of the ways to do it is to use such approaches, which is based on the adjoint state. Therefore, scattering theory, of course, comes from the concept of saying that you have a background medium and you have this perturbation in the, in the medium. Uh, and, of course, we place in this kind of formulation of with respect to velocity because it makes it easier considering the wave equation. And you have to, as a result, consider your wave field, the resulting wave field, your recorded wave field is made up of the background wave field which satisfies the equation for the background model and the scattered wave field. Therefore, when you input all of this into the wave equation and you do some mathematical manipulation, you end up with this virtual source shown here on the right of the first equation. And of course, using, using representation theorem, you could solve for the scattering energy. And uh, in this case, of course, you're using the full Green's function if you want the, uh, and which is problematic. We usually linearize. And if you write it in the frequency domain, you could write it in matrix form easily. And by considering the scattered field to be small compared to your background, you could use the Born approximation and de depend all on the background model. Therefore, this is a little bit the concept of using the Born approximation because we're going to need it to understand the radiation patterns we get from these scatter for anisotropic media. Of course, most of the time we apply full waveform inversion using the misfit given by the L2 norm. And therefore, if uh, I look at my observed data, which does not depend on the model, and my synthetic data, which depends on my model that I assume I know, uh, 
and you'd measure this misfit, which gives you a single value of how well they, uh, they fit each other. Uh, this is the whole, we're trying to minimize this E, and that's the whole concept of full weight woman version. Of course, the big problem here is our synthetic data, which depends on the model, is highly nonlinear. And that's why you get all of this multimodal. We'll talk more about this. What we do usually, we cannot use stochastic methods or because of the high dimension of our model space as well as the high dimension of our data, the huge data. Therefore, we end up using gradient methods. And in this case, uh, we do a Taylor series expansion to the uh, objective function. We end up with the gradient shown here, which is not given nothing but the Born approximation, which is the first order or the Fourier derivative. Uh, and it's multiplied by the residuals. We also need the Hessian, and it's more important for anisotropic media. Not the full Hessian, which is the second order term in this uh, expansion, but uh, we use elements of it. Therefore, the Hessian is given by two major terms. One of them, the right-hand side term, is nothing but the second order born uh, uh, expansion term. And the first term is the important term which we usually use. Uh, in what we call the Gauss-Newton uh, approach. And this term, what's key in it, it has two elements. It has a weighting element that's important to give the different parameters the right scale or different sensitive right scale. Of course, it has, and this is given mostly by the diagonal elements of this matrix, but most important, it also has a resolution aspect to it. Therefore, if these two uh, uh, Fourche uh, derivatives here are sensitive similar to two different model points, it gives you a big value here, they correlate well, and therefore they have to adjust. When you divide over the Hessian, or you take the inverse, they will have this adjusting uh, mechanism in, inherently in it to, to address the trade-off. In multi-primary inversion, we have a, a couple of issues we have to take care of or consider. We're dealing with more than one parameter at every point of our model. The parameters could have different units and different sensitivities. That's why the Hessian tends to be somewhat important. But the biggest problem is the potential trade-off, the null space. Because we know that the anisotropy parameters, some of them might not influence our data as much as we could detect. And to know how to deal with this, we're going to have to study the angular uh, dependent or sensitivity of these parameters, uh, the scattering aspect of it. And this is what we call the radiation pattern. We also have an additional parameter called rho, the density. It does not affect the kinematics, and that's why a couple of recent papers are proposing we use rho to fit the amplitudes. Why? Because we ignored elastic, we're using acoustic, Therefore, you could use this parameter or this free function to fit the amplitude and not affect the other parameters. Therefore, this is getting popular. We're going to define another parameter to do so. Of course, an acoustic anisotropy and elastic both have to be addressed. But let, let us understand acoustic first. Uh, and uh, you could guess my background would be more uh, biased to this one. A co popular combination, of course, is Thompson's parameter. The only problem with Thomson parameters, as we learned from imaging, is there is some combinations that actually define our data a little better. And in this case, the radiation patterns, as shown by, uh, uh, by many uh, previously, have not really shown a, a clear path to try to resolve these parameters. Therefore, the downside is this huge degree of freedom. We need a lot of regularization if you use anisotropic parameters uh, uh, the Thompson parameters in full waveform inversion. We saw that with many applications. And the combination is at the heart of all of this. This is from Obert, uh, uh, Stefan, and uh, his colleagues. And it's a real ex simple example that shows how much the combination impacts full waveform inversion. This is radiation patterns to try to invert for density and velocity. The two top here are the radiation patterns. The left is velocity, the right is density. 
And if you do a simple change of your inverted parameters using impedance, which is nothing but density multiplied by velocity, and velocity, look at the radiation patterns you get below. On the left, velocity. On the right, impedance. Now there is, especially on the top, which corresponds to our reflection data, there is hardly any trade-off on the one below. You could use the short offsets to invert for impedance and the larger ones to invert for velocity. You cannot have this privilege with this. It's just a simple change of the, of the parameters you use. Therefore, this is going to be even bigger in anisotropic media, deciding which parameters to use. Therefore, from uh, what Rene Plessy and a couple of his colleagues showed recently, this combination could be something we could uh, look at, which is the animal velocity, of course, which affects, it's like the continuation of velocity for an the media. Delta and eta. They showed, looked at it numerical. I contacted Rene. I said, why don't we look at the radiation patterns and try to understand it a little more? And this is what we ended up doing in a paper that just appeared. And we noticed also delta hardly affects the kinematics. Maybe we didn't need density. We could use delta as the garbage collector in that term. Therefore, this is a dispersion relation for, uh, for VTI media. Uh, the only difference is we use uh, K uh, to remove the delta influence. There's no delta influence on the kinematics. We use this K to, uh, KZ, or the wave number in the vertical direction hat, and it's scaled by 1 plus 2 delta. This is very interesting. This goes back to a paper we had in uh, Geophysical Journal International. Notice. What we measure in the data is Kx, Ky, and omega. Therefore, Kz, we have the liberty to change that and scale that and correct that later. Therefore, delta, the only requirement on delta doesn't change laterally. And therefore, the two-parameter dependency holds for even complex media. Granted, delta doesn't vary laterally. Remember, delta is ratios of velocity. Therefore, you could have the normal C model, and yet delta doesn't change laterally. Therefore, th we know, and this is seen a lot, that most, the kinematics especially, depend on eta and velocity. Therefore, we went ahead with the whole uh, uh, exercise of getting the radiation patterns. What I show here, and I'm going to show the plots that's much easier, easier, but this is the uh, radiation pattern as a function of angles shown here, given by ray parameters. And you can see for each of the four parameters we use to invert, which is the animal velocity, eta, delta, and rho, the density. And this is how these radiation plot. I, I could describe this less since it was introduced yesterday. But as, uh, as you can see here, uh, we're looking at the scattering angle, the opening angle between the wave fields for a horizontal reflector. And uh, zero corresponds mostly to zero offset. 180 corresponds to almost diving waves, where you, ha you have the opening between the two at 180. And the other side should be symmetric. Therefore, the velocity is uh, angle independent. Uh, eta, of course, sees most of its dependent for diving waves, for horizontally traveling waves, as expected. And delta mostly in the vertical direction. But look at density and delta. They look very similar. We don't need both. We could use, since delta does not affect the kinematics, it could be used as the garbage collector parameter to fit the amplitude. And yes, when you use VNMO, it affects the reflection coefficient even. Maybe Andreas Ruger could add more to that, but even at zero offset, it will affect the reflection coefficient. That's because we're parameterizing with respect to VNMO. Therefore, that aspect makes us could reduce the parameter combination to three. We did a similar exercise, but for this combination, we did for many combinations. You could review the paper. And we found out that this one is even more interesting because the horizontal velocity is solely defined by diving waves. No effects, no trade off with other parameters. Not even eta now changed with small influence here. You can easily scale eta to make it a bigger influence. These are all minor details. But again, epsilon and 
density have similar radiation pattern, you could actually use one of them, not two, because otherwise you cannot tell the two in the inversion. Another way to look at all of this is with sensitivity kernels. And, one, and this goes back to Woodward. Uh, in her paper, she actually used that to explain a lot of aspects of our sensitivity of our model to our data. And it's simply given by running two monochronic wave fields, one from the source and one from the receiver. Multiplying the two together, you get your kernel. It's like the impulse response in imaging. It's at the heart of the gradient. And you get something like this, which tells a lot. And we'll see what it tells us. Because the next, we're going to use it to do something very interesting. Therefore, these are our kernels. Therefore, depending on the frequency, you could actually convolve these with the residuals and get your update for different frequencies, different receivers, but even for a single receiver. Therefore, if my residuals are given by the right, one for direct arrival and one for reflected arrival, and you can see the uh, spectrum below, you will get these two coming out as my update for this source and receiver. One of them updates along the ray path, which is what we want, updates the background, and one updates, doesn't update the background at all, which is the reflections, which is the main issue we have with full wave form inversion. It's all in a very interesting parameter we need to understand, the model wave number uh, parameter or vector. Therefore, from looking at the sensitivity kernel here, if we plot the model wave number vector below, you can see when it's zero, that's the model wave number we're updating. That means we're updating very low uh, wave numbers, long wavelength updates, which updates our background. However, when it's pointing in a certain direction with a high value, it's really giving us something that will add to the nonlinearity, which is mostly reflection. Especially when it's dipping, it's even worse, as you can see here. Therefore, one of the things we could look at is all given by this equation. This is borrowed from diffraction tomography. It's something we know in imaging a lot. It tells you that the model wave number update is nothing but the source wave number vector uh, added to the receiver wave number vector. But what's critical if you write it in terms of frequency and scattering angle, look at what you get. The lower the frequency, the lower the wave number. This is something we learned, and that's why we start with low frequencies. And of course, scattering angle, this is what Sergey uh, and uh, Gerhard showed in their paper in 2004. As you take large scattering angle, large offsets, that's even better in getting low wave number updates. Therefore, Obvious, and that's why for these two you get by, of course, for the direct arrival in terms of scattering angle, therefore you get zero wave number update, and we end up with a smaller angle and a direction to the wave number model update for the reflection. What's interesting is some, it's very interesting to understand why or how could we uh, explain why for diving waves we end up with a zero model wave number update. What does it mean? No resolution? Not exactly. And some actually try to find new equations to explain direct arrivals or diving waves. But what it means is only along the ray that we get the zero wave number update. But away from the ray, it actually has a value. And that's where you get your resolution. Therefore, that equation applies to both. We're using the same Born approximation. We cannot divide. We cannot say in this operator or this kernel, where does diving waves start and reflections end, or vice versa. They are mixed, and we're handling them with the same gradient. Therefore, that brought up a new concept, is maybe we could divide them in terms of scattering angle, not exactly. and. This came up from a paper in 2013 that I actually, a, a, a presentation by Yu Zhang, where he showed this concept of getting, uh, getting angle gathers. A simple modification to the time lag. But they were using it to clean up 
the RTM artifacts, the low frequency. We want to use it to do something opposite here, to enhance that background update. And the thing they did is they defined zeta instead of tau, defined by the simple formula. And the idea here is to remove the dependency on velocity in the above uh, in the equation just above that. Therefore, you can see in that equation, it depends on velocity. Therefore, how are you going to resolve what velocity you have, which is defined in space coordinates, with the wave number definition of this? Therefore, that change of variables allowed us to do something like this. And now you could end up having a relation between angle gathers and the wave numbers free of velocity dependency. And you can apply it in one step. Of course, we have another approach to this, which is a mapping approach, which is even much faster. You don't even have to define this additional axis. We're going to show that at the EAG, EAGE meeting. But now we have created, this could be used to create a filter to that gradient, depending on scattering angle. And here is an example of one of these sensitivity kernel. I'm using 10 hertz, which is high in the FWI world. People want to go down to 1 and 2 hertz. But I want to show you something in that regard. Therefore, applying these gradient or, or these filters to this gradient at different gets you this. Therefore, the upper left is the gradient when we apply the filter and remove all angles below 178, I think it was 179.4. Remember, diving waves at 180. Therefore, when I tell it to remove everything below 170, that means a low cut scattering angle filter. This is the gradient I get, which is very low wave number, very smooth, hopefully updates, no reflection. Imagine, the original gradient has a lot of reflection signature in it. You allow more angles, you get less, less smoother. But look at the one on second on the right. It's almost our banana kernel. This is for a single frequency. Before we didn't have to do decimation in the frequency domain, we could do it all here and get the updates we want. The reason why it's preferred here in anisotropic medium can do it to different primers. We cannot recognize which data correspond to which parameter, but in the gradient update, we could actually apply these to the updates individually. We, have, we went ahead and tested this on the C. Having one single frequency, 5 hertz, we threw away the rest of the data. We started with this constant velocity, which is a big no-no for the C. It's a 3 kilometer per second as a starting model, and we converged of course, it's showing about 20 iteration to each angle gather uh, low cut. We start with a, a very high uh, low cut scattering angle, uh, closer to 179. Then we allow more and more, and every 20 iterations until we get to the result below on the left. And this is what you get if you apply conventional FWI, the one on the right. Of course, single frequency, 5 hertz, you expect that. It's not a perfect result. Listen, there's no magic here. We didn't invent middle wave numbers to connect. There is still at depth a missing middle wave number that connects the two. But we found a path to actually approach what we need to approach uh, and uh, uh, at the different level. Therefore, the control needs to be in the model wave number more on the decimation in the data, which we're used to. This is the ADA sensitivity kernel using a combination given by VNMO, ADA, and Delta. And you can see here, of course, one thing you could take from here is at depth, there's no chance to get a high resolution ADA from your data because there's no reflection response at depth. And this is a, a limitation that we're going to have to live with surface seismic data. But if we apply the filter, the same thing uh, comes about is that you end up first with a very smooth filter, as you can see, very, very smooth on the left upper. Then slowly you get more information to the update in eta. The update in delta, a similar story. Now we can see there's nothing in the horizontal direction. It's empty. 
you expect delta doesn't affect uh, horizontally traveling and this is something we know about and as a result the middle ones look funny but the high cut ones look smooth therefore by plugging a high cut and sticking it into your inversion and keeping it there you have a chance to make delta not influence your of course it doesn't influence the kinematic but it doesn't influence as much uh, uh, the full waveform inversion until you get close to good results for VNMO and ADA. Therefore, it gives us more options for strategies to handle uh, animal velocity, uh, to handle anisotropy by plane. Therefore, I have here, I, this is not meant for you to read it. Um, this is actually uh, 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 ingredients that, and you have many options, that I thought was possible. You could read it in the paper that is part of, not part exactly of the project review, but it, also in the, in the USB uh, that was uh, provided. And it shows two potential ingredients that you could use, or recipes that you could use to handle anisotropy. One on the left here corresponds to when you have data with good reflections. The other one corresponds when you have data with diving waves. The recipes here assume you're going to do both. Migration velocity analysis, or RFWI, which is getting very popular, and full waveform inversion. And therefore, you could filter around to, to maneuver this high nonlinearity issue. Therefore, I want to summarize what we uh, covered in the following. Of course, there's reasons why uh, we ended up using dimensionless parameters. It's not mentioned earlier, but uh, remember, these are ratios of velocities. You could regularize them. You could say delta doesn't change. Or eta doesn't change. That doesn't mean your velocity is less complex. Because it only, only depends. And we, we think that working with dimensionless parameters and one velocity is much more optimal than actually using velocities uh, to invert, like a horizontal ver vertical velocity. For diving waves, well, we are suggesting VH, eta, and epsilon as a good combination. Remember, epsilon is now the uh, garbage collector parameter doesn't affect the kinematics. The only two that affect the kinematics is VH and eta. Therefore, epsilon is here just to fit the amplitudes, and that's what you're actually inverting for. And uh, for reflections, we think if the reflections are prominent, via VNMO, eta. We looked at a lot of combinations. They're all in the paper, and uh, we think that this combination is optimal for such an inversion. And in all cases, th in this case, Delta will play this garbage collector. I don't know. I took this name from somebody. I didn't, I didn't invent it. Uh, but it becomes the garbage collector parameter. Uh, definitely, I want to acknowledge Rene Plessy. Uh, uh, we had a chance to talk about this and develop the paper. Therefore, part of what I'm showing, not the filters, but the, the radiation patterns is part of this uh, collaboration with, with him. Definitely CDMP for having me here and for the, uh, for the work. Uh, and this is most of this, uh, especially the anisotropic part, was developed during my CDP time here. And of course, Kaust for being patient with all my travel and other things I'm not going to mention. <laughs> Thank you very much.